there, and they said, hmm. <laughs> so they pulled a switch. They took the dead baby, wrapped it up in the royal swaddling clothes, put it up on a hillside, told the local noble, look, dead baby, told the king, look, dead baby, story's over, raised live baby as their own, and thus Cyrus survives. <laughs> story is told then that Cyrus grew up and he went to high school. And while in high school, he did what boys will often do in high school. You know, you put a bunch of boys in a room and a pecking order will soon establish along with certain knots of blood. Um, they decided to play a game and the game was king for a day. So each boy got to be king for a day and they would give orders and everybody else would obey. Came time for Cyrus's, Cyrus to become king for a day and he started giving orders and said, Who's going to give orders? You're, you're a mule. I'm not going to listen to your orders. You're, from, you're a farmer's kid. I'm not going to listen to your orders. And, he, and when people wouldn't obey him, he pulled out whips and he started whipping them and making them do his orders. And they were rather disturbed by this. One of the kids he whipped was the son of a local nobleman. The son of the local nobleman went home after school and said, Daddy, this creepy kid Cyrus, some farmer's kid, he's been whipping me and making me do what he says. Local noble thought that was rather odd. Later that day, he was meeting with the king, Astyages, and he told him the story about this strange kid in high school, farmer's kid, who whipped people. And he said, what's his name again? Cyrus? How old is he? Hmm. And so he said, that, that kid that I told you to kill, the baby, my grandson, you killed him, right? He said, oh yeah, I showed you dead baby. So then the local noble went to the farmer and said, okay, farmer, <laughs> you know. Okay, farmer, <laughs> tell me what you did with the kid. And the farmer, of course, in a panic, said, I saved him, really, it is, it is Cyrus. He told the king, the nobleman did, and the king said, thank God. All these years I've been feeling so guilty that I killed my own grandson, and now to find out he's alive, it's time for a celebration. We need to have a celebration in honor of Cyrus and restore him to his appropriate dignity. We're going to have a party and we're going to celebrate you because you're the one who helped save him. And tell you what, you send your sons over here. We'll bring Cyrus over here. You tell your sons um, what your favorite meal is. We'll cook your favorite meal and have a great, a great banquet. So the day comes. They have the great banquet. They have wonderful steak. Uh, when they get through with the steak, uh, King Astyages says to the nobleman, well, how'd you like your steak? He said, oh, the steak was great. He said, good, would you like dessert? He said, oh, I'd love dessert. So they pull out some covered platters, lay the dessert on the table. They pull the tops off the covered platters, and on the covered platters are the heads and hands of his two sons. They had just fed him the rest. <laughs> Cyrus was there, and Cyrus saw what had been done to this man who had at least indirectly saved him. Cyrus let, let out a basically a primal scream, ran out of the room and vowed revenge. He went and he now began to gather an army together of Persians. Launched a rebellion against his grandfather Astyages and was successful. And by these means King Cyrus became King Cyrus of the Persians. And now King Cyrus begins a massive campaign of conquest. He starts to expand to the west and did what even the Assyrians could never have imagined. He conquered very quickly all the way through what we call Turkey. He finally reached in 546 the western regions of Turkey a kingdom, an independent kingdom over there called the Lydians, ruled by a Greek guy by the name of Croesus. Croesus or Croesus. You might have heard the expression in English, the riches of Croesus. If you've heard of it, anyhow. It's, it's an expression just for a super rich dude, right? Um, so here's how the story was told. Athens, Greece. There was a great wise man of Athens. His name was Solon. Solon had just uh, done a major revision of the laws of Athens and went into voluntary exile for 10 years because he didn't want to deal with the consequences. He was hanging out in Lydia, and he went and visited King Croesus. King Croesus invited him in, treated him very graciously, said, uh, took him around and showed him storerooms full of gold and jewels. He's just fabulously wealthy. Sardis, by the way, is the town, the capital town of the Lydians. Great archaeological site. And then... Um, after the tour, 
King Croesus said to the Greek wise man, Solon, So, Solon, I hear you're a wise man. Tell me, who is the happiest man in the world? Solon said, you know, there was this young man from Athens, and he uh, was a man of great virtue. Uh, he was respected by everyone. He was a great soldier. Uh, he fought and died uh, to, to save his friends in Athens. I think he's probably the happiest man in the world. Well, Chris was a little bit taken back by this story. He said, well, okay, so who's the second happiest man in the world? So I said, well, you know, there were these two young men uh, from northern Greece, and uh, their mother wanted to go visit uh, a temple of a goddess, but the, uh, she was not feeling well, and their ox was lame. And so these two young men um, hooked themselves up to the cart, and they hauled the cart over to the, the uh, temple of the goddess, um, to the great acclaim of all the people who were there, the mother went in to pray to the goddess, and when she prayed to the goddess, she said, give, please give my son the very best gift of all. And amidst the great uh, respect and applause by all the people around, the two sons fell dead. They're the happiest, second happiest, said Solon. And now Croesus is really frustrated. He said, wait a minute, what are you talking about? Some dead guy, some person playing like an ox, what are you talking about? Is my happiness so contemptible to you that I don't even make the top two? And Solon, in that ever smarmy, wise man way, said, Oh, Croesus, Croesus, call no man happy until he is dead. Until then, he is not happy, just lucky. So, the next year, King Croesus decided he would like to expand his kingdom. But he wasn't sure if it was wise. So he sent emissaries to visit the Oracle of Apollo at Delphi, the famous Oracle of Prophecy of ancient Greece. And his question was, should I engage in a campaign of conquest? And the Oracle famously answered, if you cross the Halys River, which is the eastern border of Lydia, if you cross the Halys River, you will destroy a great empire. Well, King Cyrus had just moved up to the Halys River. He thought, wow, if I cross the Halys River, I'll destroy Cyrus. So he attacked King Cyrus with his armies and succeeded in destroying a great empire, his own. Uh, he was defeated. He himself was captured. He was sentenced to be burned to death on a pile of wood. They placed him on top of the pile of wood, started the fire, and while he's sitting on top of the fire, King Christus says, Oh, Solon, oh, Solon, if only I had listened to you. And King Cyrus heard him saying this. He said, what's he saying? What's he saying? And nobody could tell. So he said, so he said pull out some buckets of water. Throw out, burn out, you know, get rid of that fire. I want to talk to him. So they pulled him down. He said, what are you talking about, Solon? And he told him about the story of call no man happy until he, was died, until he had died. And uh, King Cyrus was so impressed that he decided to spare the life of King Croesus and make him personal advisor thereafter. So <laughs> Cyrus spent the rest of his life with, um, with Croesus. Now... Cyrus is going to work his way down to Babylon. Remember, Nabonidus is not there. He's got a regent uh, watching over things in his stead. He actually diverted the Euphrates River so that he could get under the walls into Babylon and by that means was able to take the city of Babylon. So ends the Babylonian Empire. Um, this in 539. The empire that Cyrus will build will be simply massive. But what happened in 539, of course, is he inherited the Hebrews. And he inherited the area that used to be Israel. And at this point, he did a really interesting thing. He decided, this is really important in the history of civilization, he decided it's better to be loved than to be feared. This is a new experiment in human history, as far as we know. He decided it's better to be loved than to be feared. Now, it's harder. It's always harder. And, of course, he'd engendered plenty of fear by conquering people. But the thing is, King Cyrus is a polytheist. He believes in multiple gods. If you believe in multiple gods, there's always room for one more. And that's a good thing, because if you adopt other people's gods maybe those gods also will favor you. And so what did King Cyrus do? Oh, by the way, we have a, um, do I have a picture? 
Yeah, here we go. This. The Cyrus Cylinder has been discovered. In the Cyrus Cylinder, we find out a policy whoops, that um, Cyrus seemed to practice in many, multiple places, and that is when he conquered a group of people, he honored their gods and he supported their local temples in the hopes that they, in turn, would support him. He did the same thing with the Hebrews. He finds out he's inherited this <laughs> pot of Hebrews in his backyard in Babylon, and he said, hey, anybody want to go back to Jerusalem? Go. It's okay. In fact, I'll support you. And when you go, will you do me a favor? Rebuild that famous temple of yours. <coughs> Honor that famous God of yours. You people are a bit weird, this whole monotheism thing. But nevertheless, go worship that God of yours. Go rebuild your temple. And, when, and I'll even fund part of it. I'll send you some wood. I'll send you some stone cutters. Go. I'll even let a Hebrew be the governor of the area. What I ask in return is pray for me. That's how you lead by love rather than by fear. And by the way, it worked marvelously. So they go back. We learn about this story of the return of some, and that's just some of the Hebrews, it's not all of them, but some of the Hebrews from exile, and they go back and they rebuild their temple, and they rebuild their wall, and they, and they engage in self-governance under, of course, the king of Persia. We learn about that largely in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. And it's also the period of time of the last prophets, people like Haggai. That's how you say it. Haggai. You got a Haggai. Say it. Say it. Haggai. Now look really close to your neighbor and go, Haggai. No, don't do this. Um, and Zechariah. Um, these guys are, are uh, during this period. So this is the so-called return from exile. Okay. Um, it's also the time when Ezra the scribe was active. Nehemiah was one of the governors. Um, Zerubbabel was the original governor, uh, Hebrew, by the name of Zerubbabel. Loosely speaking, I'm not going to go into details, um, Cyrus was succeeded by, actually, there's another guy named Cambyses who was in between, but then Darius and then Xerxes. Xerxes is the guy who's called in the Hebrew Bible a Hashverosh often corrupted into English as Ahasuerus. I'm not sure how that's any better. Um, but anyhow, he's the, um, the book of Esther. So he's the king in the book of Esther, Ahasuerus. So he's the guy who has the beauty contest and the spend the night contest and all those kinky things that you'll read about later. Um, anyhow, that's the, uh, that Esther won. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, <laughs> um, that's uh, and the whole story of the book of Esther that the celebration of Purim is around and all of that. Okay, that's, and that's one of the last books of the Hebrew Bible. So that's Xerxes that we're talking about. Xerxes is also famous. So have you seen the movie 300? Yeah. Okay, and the sequel? Okay, that is Xerxes. That's the same Persians attacking Greece. So it's Greeks fighting against them at the Battle of Thermopylae and the Battle of Salamis and all that. That's the background. Same dude. Okay, Xerxes. So when he's not having beauty contests, he's trying to conquer Greece and failing, as it turns out. Darius, by the way, also attacked Greece. Initially, he was the uh, loser at the Battle of Marathon. If you're familiar with the Battle of Marathon of 490 BC. I teach Greek history too, but don't get me started on that. <laughs> Here is the Persian Empire. Look at that baby. It is just massive. Maybe four times the size of the Assyrian Empire. It is just huge. Remember, this is the Persian homeland over here. But all that they conquered, including Egypt. I mean, it was just this massive empire. And it lasts a long time. You know, 539 B.C. up until 331. Okay, so over 200 years this thing lasts. Pretty remarkable. Okay, so here's Cyrus, and there's the Cyrus Cylinder. Here's one of his capitals, Persepolis. Here is his tomb, Cyrus' tomb. Here is the Mount Rushmore of antiquity. This thing's a huge mountain right outside of Baghdad. And they inscribed up on the side of the mountain this procession, and this is all, it's a trilingual inscription, including Old Persian, 
Um, this is, if you're familiar with the Zoroastrian religion, um, this is Ahura Mazda, the god of sports cars. Um, no. <laughs> There's a, there's a gnome on the end there from Travelocity. <laughs> that's right, Travelocity gnome. Oh, that's good. I like that. I like that. Um, this is Darius the First, by the way. Who, Darius, he's the, that's him. Not the gnome. Um, and, and here is also Darius the First, and behind him is Xerxes. You can see the stylized ways the Persians were portrayed. Okay, so there's our three great kingdoms now, and that gives us the big picture. Now what we need to understand also is the regional picture. So it's, this isn't just a world of big empires. The Hebrews are not a big empire, are they? The Hebrews are a small regional power, and there's lots of small regional powers that are also going to be players in our story, so we need to come to terms with who are these people. So a lot of those names that you find hard to pronounce, yeah, yeah. Um, just going back, was Cyrus, Darius, and Xerxes, were they related? Like, were they um, Darius is not related to Xerxes. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Darius is not related to Cyrus. There was a, a dispute, and he ended up on top. Um, Xerxes is the son of Darius. And by the way, let's be careful. There is a Darius the first, a Xerxes the first, a Xerxes the second, and a Darius the second. And it's Darius the second whom Alexander the Great will kill when he takes over in 331. So there's two Xerxes and two Dariuses, so it's a little bit, but for our purposes, it's mainly the first ones. Darius the first, Xerxes the first, and then we're out of the, the, the Old Testament is over. Okay, those other guys come afterwards. Okay, now regional powers. Um, who are these other people? How about those Philistines? Uh, by the way, you're seeing here the distinctive, you see this in Philistine sites when you excavate, this is Philistine bichrome pottery, some of the finest pottery uh, of the period. Now, let me make sure, yeah, okay. So here's, the Philistine lands are along the coast, primarily what we today call the Gaza Strip. The area of Ashkelon, Ashdod, Gaza itself, Gaza City, Gath, Goliath is the most famous Philistine, right? Goliath of Gath. Um, these are the, there's five Philistine cities, so you can see the Philistine cities right down here. So the Philistine homeland is largely there on the coast. So we see a little closer view. So Ashdod, Ashkelon, Gaza, Gath, that area. Um, this is a recent archaeological excavation at a, at a place called in Arabic, Tel Es Safi. They believe, the archaeologists do, that this is Gath. They think they finally found Gath. And you just see the very beginnings of the excavation here. Okay. Um, well, let's go back. Philistines. If you notice in your Hebrew Bible, you're reading along and, and all, you don't have any Philistines, no references to Philistines. You have a bunch of Canaanites and, you know, Girgashites and Hivites and Jebusites and all that kind of stuff, but you don't have any uh, Philistines until just about the time of Saul, Saul David. And all of a sudden, the Philistines are major players. They just come out of nowhere. And then remember, we get that one picture where the Philistines are in the Iron Age and the Hebrews are not. So the Philistines come out of nowhere and show up on the coast. What's going on here? Well, there's two other big things going on in the world. One is the Trojan War. So the Homer, the Iliad, and the Odyssey, the Trojan War traditionally dates to about 1200 BC. So the Trojan War is going on over here just off the map over here and it's Greeks against Trojans and in the aftermath of the Trojan War all the Greek epics tell about this great disruption archaeologically speaking in Greece right around 1100 BC all these massive sites ancient Greek highly civilized Bronze Age sites with huge fortifications one by one they're leveled there's burn layers and weirdly, nothing is built on top of them. They're abandoned. Widespread abandonment of these very sophisticated Greek sites. The Greeks who had won the Trojan War are now getting punched out by somebody and disappearing. Meanwhile, Egyptian records talk about major attacks from the sea by some peoples they call sea peoples. 
And Egypt has to strain every resource to be able to keep these sea peoples from conquering Egypt. They, they are successful. The sea peoples do not conquer Egypt, and the Egyptians know nothing more about them. They disappear, except two interesting words that they called the sea peoples. One is Peleset, and the other is Shardania. Shardania sounds suspiciously similar to Sardinia. And it turns out, this is really weird, you know where Sardinia is? Off the coast of Italy? Big island off the coast of Italy? Up here in northern Israel on the coast is one archaeological site, only one, and the buildings look just like ancient buildings from Sardinia. <laughs> we know nothing else about this. Just Maybe that's what they meant when they said Chardonnay. The Philistines, the word Philistine and Peleset seem to be related. So maybe what they uh, are naming is that same group that ended up, they failed to take by sea, Egypt, and so they basically deflected over to the coast, over here, and landed there. One more fascinating piece of evidence. When you go to Greece, and you go to a site like Mycenae, or Tiryns, or um, Argos, and you dig down to that place where the um, Bronze Age destruction, where nobody built on top of it, I mean later they built on top of it, but not right away, the very latest pottery produced by those Greeks was this thin-walled, flat gray color that we call minion ware. It's unique. We don't see it anywhere else. Come over to Israel and go to Ashkelon or Ashdod and dig down to the very lowest layers, the very first Philistines who were there, the lowest level of the Philistines, and you see the same kind of pottery. Mm. Gray minion ware. Mm. All of this suggests that you have something of a Greek refugee population who left Greece amidst a lot of turmoil when those cities were being destroyed and landed on the coast of Israel after causing some trauma to Egypt. If this is true, and if you pay careful attention to your chronology, that suggests that, for example, somebody like Agamemnon, the great, huge Greek warlord of Mycenae, and a guy like Goliath of Gath, Goliath may be something like Agamemnon's grandson. Isn't that weird to think of? We don't know for sure, of course, but at least generationally it makes sense. Culturally it makes sense. It makes sense of the pottery movement. It makes sense of the destruction of cities. Um, and what's really weird about this, though, is if this is true, if the Philistines, the origin of the Philistines is in fact a Greek refugee population, very quickly they adopted Canaanite language, not Greek, in their new land. Maybe because that's what they needed to get by culturally in terms of trade or whatever. We don't know. But fascinating stuff. Anyhow, the Philistines are going to be players for us. Remember that David spends a lot of his life fighting Philistines. Um, Saul does, Solomon does to some degree. Um, Philistines keep being players. They are, and by the way, it's funny, in English, we use the term Philistine sometimes. If you call somebody a Philistine, that's not kind. Okay, it means Philistine generally, if you call somebody a Philistine in English, by the way, you should try this out. Call people Philistine. It's kind of fun. Um, if, you <laughs> if you call somebody Philistine in English, it, it generally means they like, don't take a bath. You know, they're kind of ugly and gross. Yeah, you see, this will be... Now you can use that word, can't you? Oh, you were such a Philistine. So, uh, <laughs> what's interesting is exactly the opposite was the case. In this area, at this time in Israel, the Philistines are the most sophisticated. They, write, they have the best pottery, the best architecture, probably the best clothes, maybe the best sanitation, who knows, but in any case, um, sort of the opposite of the implications in the, of the word in modern English. Okay, how about Phoenicians? Well, I already mentioned Phoenicians. Phoenicians are these um, seafaring Canaanite people up here, and their capital city is Tyre and Sidon, kind of twin cities. Tyre's an island, Sidon is on the coast. Um, up here, uh, modern Lebanon, the coast of modern Lebanon. 
The Phoenicians were great seafarers. They, they liked to get out on the sea. Um, most famously, they, they uh, launched a major trading post in North Africa called Carthage. So the Carthaginians and the Phoenicians are, um, Carthage was planted by the Phoenicians. By the way, on this map, so here's Tyre and Sidon, and everything in brown is kind of a major trading zone for the Phoenicians. So you can see they're all over the place, including Sardinia. Um, there's Carthage, etc. So you get a feel for the, the, the Phoenicians are kind of all over the place. The most famous Phoenician for our purposes is one Jezebel. Oh, you also have, by the way, King Hiram of Tyre. Who's King Hiram of Tyre? What does he do? Maybe remember? He supplies to Solomon the cedars of Lebanon for the temple project. Remember that? So there's an alliance going on between the Hebrews and the Phoenicians. And in fact, Jezebel is a product of that alliance. Ahab married Jezebel. This is what you do, right? You have these, these alliances, marriage alliances. So she's the daughter of the king of Tyre. So he marries Jezebel. So she's the most famous. Of course, she doesn't, uh, she doesn't come off that well because she's rather enthusiastic worshiper of Baal and, and persecutor of prophets and that sort of thing. Um, but she is a, a Phoenician. So they enter into the economic configuration with the wood and all of that, and they also enter in with a marriage alliance. Then there are Ammonites, Moabites, and Edomites. So now we have to flip our map. Hopefully the map shows these. Okay, so here's Moab, Ammon, and, well, Adam's over here too. Um, so these are, these are, in other words, this trans, what we call modern Jordan. Oh, sorry, yeah, here's Adam. Um, uh, the most famous place, uh, well, let's see, An oh, first of all, Ammonites. Um, these are descendants of Lot's daughter, if you remember from Genesis. Lot's daughter, um, and the child's name was Ben-Ami, so the Ammonites comes from that. So if, in other words, these are sort of cousins, cousins of the Hebrews, and they're over here. Um, then we have Moabites, so that's Lot's other daughter, Moab, you remember that whole Lot story, kind of kinky thing. Um, so Moabites, they're over here. Remember Ruth, she's a Moabite, so that's over here. Um, they worship a god named Chemosh, who, um, and they actually engage in human sacrifice, one of the very few in the area that engage in human sacrifice. Um, we also know about a King Mesha of Moab. You'll be reading about him. The Hebrews fought a battle against King Mesha of Moab. We have King Mesha's side of the story. This is the Moabite stone, and we have confirmation of that battle and in in both the alliances and the tensions between the Hebrews and the Moabites in the Moabite stone. So very interesting archaeological discovery there. And then we have Edomites who are descendants of Esau. Remember Jacob and Esau thing, and that's Edomites. The most famous city of the Edomites, although it was not built by in this period, it's built later, is uh, Petra, the rose red city of Petra, stone city. Okay, so there you can see the, the group. Then we have Gesherites. Gesherites are here. Oh, nice map. This is good. Geshur. What we now call the Golan Heights. This area northeast of the Sea of Galilee. This is kind of a mountain. It's an old volcano, actually, uh, that goes up here. And then you look over the top down to Damascus in Syria. So the other side is Syria. And these hills are called Geshur. The capital city of Geshur was Bethsaida, where I do archaeology. Okay, so we'll be talking about that. Um, King Tal, the, one of the most famous king we know of Geshur is King Talmai. He had a daughter named Ma'aka. Ma'aka was the first wife of King David, by which she had a son. First son, namely, anybody? Absalom. And when Absalom rebelled against David, where did he go? He went to Grandpa's place. That is Bethsaida, Geshur. Um, so this is a marriage alliance. Right, well, another one of those marriage alliances, David marrying Ma'aka, the daughter of the king of the Geshurites. Then there's the Arameans. Remember, I mentioned them already. That's the Syrians. So they're here. So, so Aram is Syria. Damascus is their kind of headquarters. So these are the Arameans. They speak what? Aramaic. 
right? And Arameans speak Aramaic. Later, that will become the common language of the area, and Jesus will speak Aramaic. Um, by the way, most of the kings of the Arameans will be named Ben-Hadad. Okay, so you keep running into Ben-Hadads, and they seem to live a long time. It's not just one guy. <laughs> a bunch of guys are named Ben-Hadad, because after, Ben means son of. So if your Ben-Hadad has a son, he'll be Ben-Hadad. He'll have a son, he'll be Ben-Hadad. Um, Hazael is another name that once in a while comes up. Uh, so these are kind of regional players that once in a while are allies of the Israelites and once in a while are enemies. So there again, you can see the map. Here is Bethsaida. This is where I work. This is the city gate complex at Bethsaida. We'll be looking at it in more detail later. Don't forget Egypt. Egypt is still a player, even though the Assyrians ruled over it for a while and the Persians will later. Um, especially in the early period, Egypt is really important for us, especially one pharaoh named Shoshank in Egyptian. In the Hebrew Bible, he's called Shishak. Shishak. And um, very importantly, in the year 925 or 926, and we would get this down to a year, 925 or 926, a very important event happened in Israel. A Shishak attack. Yeah. All right, a Shishak attack. He attacked Israel. And he sacked a bunch of places, and that left burn layers. So if you can identify the Shishak attack in archaeology, you know that anything underneath the burn layer is pre-925, anything after the layer is post-925. So the Shishak attack is really important, and by the way, we're right just after Solomon. Also, Pharaoh Necho is going to be very important in a later generation. You see his dates. He fought in a major battle, the Battle of Megiddo in 609 which resulted in, in, it was a rather foolish move of Josiah, King Josiah of Judah, um, attacked him at Megiddo and got himself killed in 609. Um, he was also Pharaoh Necho involved in the Battle of Carchemish, where he lost to King Nebuchadnezzar. So in the early period, the Egyptians, both these two pharaohs, Shishak and Necho, are players for our purposes. Okay, don't forget your 12 tribes of Israel. And you, you've been paying attention to them on a map, I see, so you, you, you remember all those, so I don't need to go into that. Okay. Wow. All right, let's, um, let's conclude by having somebody read 2 Chronicles 36 for us. Because we've been talking now from a very human perspective, right? This is, this is international geopolitics going on around this world. How does all this look from a divine perspective? Um, this is the very end of the book of Second Chronicles, and it rather sums it up nicely. Would somebody read, please, for us, good and loud? The Lord, the God of their ancestors, repeatedly sent his prophets to warn them, for he had compassion on his people and his temple. But the people mocked these messengers of God and despised the word. They scoffed at the prophets until the Lord's anger could, not, could no longer be restrained and nothing could be done. So the Lord brought the king of Babylon against them. The Babylonians killed Judah's young men, even chasing them into the temple. They had no pity on the people, killing both young men and young women, the old and the infirm. God handed all of them over to Nebuchadnezzar. The king took home to Babylon all the art articles, large and small, used in the temple of God, and the treasures from both the Lord's temple and from the palace of the king and his officials. Then his army burned the temple of God, tore down the walls of Jerusalem, burned all the palaces, and completely destroyed everything of value. The few who survived were taken as exiles to Babylon, and they became servants to the king and his sons until the kingdom of Persia came to power. So the message of the Lord spoken through Jeremiah was fulfilled. The land finally enjoyed its Sabbath rest, lying desolate until the 70 years were fulfilled, just as the prophets had said. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord fulfilled the prophecy he had given through Jeremiah. He stirred the heart of Cyrus to put his proclamation in writing and to send it throughout his kingdom. This is what King Cyrus of Persia says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has appointed me to build him a temple at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Any of you who are the Lord's people may go there for this task, and may the Lord your God be with you. Okay. In other words, 
all this stuff we've been talking about, can you see God's watchful eye at work? God stirring up the heart of Cyrus. God fulfilling the prophecy of Jeremiah, etc. That is, this stuff isn't happening in a divine vacuum. God isn't sitting around saying, boy, I wonder what's going to happen next. Right? Um, he's at work in the midst of all of this as these major chess pieces of the international world are being moved about. God is at work for his purposes. Uh, and there's something to me at least uh, profoundly, profoundly helpful in, in viewing things from that perspective. So as we, as we look at things from a human perspective, let's keep in mind the divine perspective that over sees the whole. Okay, we have 20 minutes. Let's, um, let's do some archaeology, shall we? Yeah. Okay. So what do archaeologists do and what can we learn from it? That's basically what we're after. Um, we'll talk first about the making of a tell, tells and stratification, analysis, dating finds, and connections with written sources. So first of all, the making of a tell. What you are looking at here is a tell. When you go to Israel or any place else and you want to excavate, you, you want to excavate where it's going to be useful. You want to excavate where people lived. And so you want to find a place of human habitation, and they're not that hard to find because they look like this. They are a, a hill of accumulated trash, really. The detritus of human civilization. So now let's think like an ancient person and try to understand what lies beneath. Because one of the things you have to do if you're going to do archaeology, uh, you have to exercise your x-ray vision. And that means you need to train it. So. Think like an ancient person. What you want to dig in is an ancient city, right? A place where people lived. So if you're going to build a city, where are you going to build it? What are the prerequisites you're going to look for for your site? Water. Yes. Water. Okay, we need water. So we'll have a little water here. Right? It could be a river. It could be a lake. It could be a well. could be a, a, a you know, spring. Anything like that. Okay, we have water. That's nice. What do we else do we want? Natural protection. Natural protection. What, what will give you natural protection? Like a hill. A hill. So let's go move to the top of Mauna Kea. What do you think? Yeah. Not? Why not? Why not? <laughs> okay, why not? <laughs> Does anybody have an answer to that question? <laughs> okay, you will die really soon. Um, right? It won't protect you. I mean, it's really high, right? It's hard to attack, but who the heck's going to attack you? Right? Who cares? You don't. For one thing, you don't have this. Right? For another thing, what else don't you have? Like food. Right? So, oh, that's a problem. Okay. So you're right. We need elevation helps. There's a rule in history. You ready? It's easier to throw things down than up. Right? That's a very important rule in history. It's easier to throw things down than up. So you do want elevation, but you've got to compromise with reality here. What else do you want? Vegetation. Vegetation. What kind of land do you want? Fertile land. Fertile land, right? Because you want to farm, right? By the way, cities depend on agriculture. If you don't have agriculture, you don't have cities because if you don't have agriculture, you've got to keep moving. And there's no sense in building a city. But if you have agriculture, then you want to stay put because you've got to protect your fields and you want to reap the produce. So, let's see, what do we need? Oh, here we go, fertile land. There we go, fertile land. And now we need to go to our protection. What else do we want? We want a bump, right? We want a bump. You need a, that, so you can throw stuff down. You're not just gonna camp out here, because people will throw, you know, it's hard to defend that. So you try to find a compromise where you got water, a bump, and f flat arable land where you can grow stuff. Okay, so let's build a city, shall we? Yeah. So you build a city. There we go. <laughs> we built a teepee on top of the city. Whee! All right. Um, now, this is a very nice city. Isn't this a nice city? It's a very nice city. Um, now you're going to learn the second rule of history. The second rule of history is if you have something nice, 
somebody else will try to take it, right? Now, of course, at this point in our history, we don't understand that rule. So somebody comes along and says, ooh, that's nice. I think I'll take it. And they beat you up, and they knock down your teepee, and they make a pile of rubble. And now, of course, because it's a nice place, they're going to move in. And they're going to rebuild. Are they going to use your old house to rebuild? Let's, let's, this is all made out of stone, right? Because Middle East, it's all stone. So it's made out of stone. So they just knocked down your house, and now they're going to move in. Are they going to reuse the stones they knocked down? No? None of them. Some of them. Some of them. Which ones? The good ones. <laughs> Whatever they find useful, right? They'll, are they going to bring in new stuff? Yes. They're probably going to bring in new stuff, too. There's probably more of them than there was of you because they beat you up, after all. So they're going to use a combination of old stuff and new stuff, and they're going to rebuild. Right? But now they know the second rule of history, so what are they going to do? Protect it. So what are you going to do? Wall. wall. Build a wall. Okay. So now we have a wall. Don't you feel good? Yeah. This is a lovely place. But of course, now this is a really nice place. And somebody else comes along and says, boy, I'd like that place. And they beat you up and they knock down your wall. Right? And then they rebuild. Right? And they build a bigger wall. And they might do other fortification, you know, a fancy gate so they keep you from attacking their gate. They might put really steep walls over here and, and cover them with, like, mud so they can, like, when you attack, throw water off the side and so you try to attack and you bring up your battering ram and you fall down. Um, that kind of stuff. So people did all these kinds of things in the ancient world. But eventually somebody's going to beat them up and an earthquake's going to come along and knock it down and somebody else is going to beat them and eventually this is what you get. That. That's what that is. A layer cake of civilization. But it's only that stuff that wasn't reused. Some of the stuff is being reused, other stuff is not being reused. So the stuff that's not reused is trash, essentially, right? This stuff that and so we get layers. We call these layers strata. And the accumulation of all this together we call a tell. So now when you've got this, how are you going to start to excavate it? Okay, you've got this thing. What's going to be your method for excavating this thing? Remembering that your objective, you're going to destroy in order to learn. That's what archaeology is. You destroy in order to learn. So you better destroy carefully because you only get one shot. So how are you going to do it? One layer at a time, somebody says. Okay, one layer at a time. That'll work, right? The peel and onion method. So I excavate straight on one. And then when you get through, excavate stratum too. Keep careful records, take careful pictures, or, ah, do a trench. Do a trench, right? So you could do this. Now, why would you choose peel an onion as opposed to doing a trench, or vice versa? Um, let me tell you something. Okay, so this campus, Mark was just telling me, this campus, the area that's built upon is about 40 acres? Okay, that site is about 40 acres. Okay, so the whole area here that's been built on, okay, that's about the size of Bethsaida. Um, now, all of you are going to be the archaeology team. We normally have about 30 to 50 at a time. So you'd be a pretty good sized crew. You're a good sized crew. You're going to work all summer, five days a week, on excavating this entire campus in straight on one. Straight on one's a foot deep. And you're going to do it with a spoon. <laughs> How long is it going to take you? A really, really long, you know, like 80 years to do straight in one. And then, uh, by the way, it costs several hundred thousand dollars to do an excavation for one year, well, for one summer. Um, so, reality is that skin and onion method is nice, but it's not practical if you have a very big site. If it's a small site, like you're working in a cave, or something like that, absolutely. Do, do the peel and onion method. Um, that's, that's really nice. But if you want to do something bigger, you've got to compromise. Since our trench method. So you can, trench is nice because right away, what do you find out? How many straight do you have? Right? What else? You can find out if there's any burn layers in there. You can find out different characteristics of the soil, any particular finds you find on your way down. You're going to keep careful records each layer on the way down. Um, so that's the other method. And both have been used. Um, I think I've got a couple pictures here. Okay, so here's Heinrich Schliemann at Troy. 
Heinrich Schliemann excavated Troy in 1870. Here's his excavation. He did a giant trench. And what he was able to show is, oh, look at all these different strata. Here's stratum two, here's stratum three, here's stratum four, et cetera, right? And you can see the different strata, and he was carefully looking at that, but of course, now you've got this big chunk out of the middle, and so anything, you know, what was up here, and, what's, and, and how does that relate to what's over here and what's over here, you, you lose all that when you, when you do a trench. Because of this, most archaeologists today do this. So let's do a top view. What you do is you take a, you know, surveying equipment and do um, usually measure a grid pattern, usually five by five meters, but it depends on the size of the tell. And what you do is you excavate one square at a time. That's what they're doing there. And you don't excavate the whole thing. You leave like a meter on the side. So you excavate that. One straight them down and then follow your x-ray vision. So you excavate this and you find nothing. Okay, try the next one. And you excavate, or try going down to the next stratum, right? And then you try, well, let's try this one. And you excavate here, and oh, look at this. I exposed a wall. See that? See this right here? Exposed a wall going across. So what do you do then? You follow your x-ray vision. Aha! If there's a wall going here, then what do I want to do? I think I'll try here. And sure enough, I try here and I find, oh, the wall goes here. And now what am I going to do? Go over here, right? You just keep chasing your clues as you go. Um, and that's just for walls. I mean, it could be any kind of things that you're finding that you think are interesting. Um, and of course, the whole time you're taking careful pictures and records and so on. Any special finds you have, you're, you're measuring them in three dimensions to know exactly where they are, etc. So um, and these are called bulk walls. You typically leave these one meter walls around the side so a later archaeologist can come back and double check something. But if you have a continuing structure going like here, maybe you want to remove the bulk walls so you can see the whole building emerging from the ground. Then of course you need an archaeologist. They come in all shapes and sizes. For the most part in Israel, um, almost everybody who does archaeology is volunteer. So here's a group I took. She's a 70-year-old woman who's getting nice and dirty. That's one of the prerequisites. You've got to get nice. Remember that dirty? We're always talking dirty in archaeology. Uh, there she is. Uh, here's another couple of archaeologists, a mother and a daughter. Um, notice that the mother wants the big pick. She wants to show anybody. You're not supposed to use that when you're doing archaeology, but uh, she, she's actually really strong and so I didn't want to mess with her. Um, here's a couple other, really, look at the dirt. That's some good dirt, isn't it? Oh, you gotta love it. <laughs> and here, this is how you do not want to look as an archeologist. This is really clean. Do not do that. Don't do, but he was very proud of himself, John, uh, his wife I showed you earlier. Um, John was sifting for the day. So actually he got pretty, he, he's very meticulous. He likes to be very clean. And he got all dirty because he was shaking a sifter. And, and what he found was a coin. So that's very cool. Now, um, how do you do analysis? That is, how do you uh, make sense out of the things you're finding? Um, well, one of the major, the two major methods, one is stratification and the other is typology. So stratification is, you know, if I'm working in stratum three, how does that relate to one and four? Or two and four, right? How, how do you relate in the layers to each other. You always keep track of three dimensions. And that, because something you know about the stratum, right? Where's the old stuff? The old stuff is down. The new stuff is up. And how much older is this than this? Or this than this, sorry. You don't know. What you know is relative chronology. You know that this is older than this. What you don't know is how much older. It could be immediate, or it could have been abandoned for 300 years and then there's a gap separating it. You don't know until you look at your evidence. And one of the chief means of evidence you use is typology. I'll end with this. Cooking pots. This is just one example. You can do typology with anything. In Hawaii, I do some archaeology in Hawaii as well. Um, in Hawaii, the thing that you find all over the place is fish hooks. So if you want to date ancient finds, uh, you know, you look for fish hooks because there's different styles made at different times and you can develop a fish hook chronology. They're made out of bone or shell or these kinds of things. Um, in Israel and many parts of the world, it's pottery. Hawaiians didn't have pottery. Um, but, but 
ancient people in, in, from the Neolithic period, they had pottery in this part of the world. Pottery, the nice thing is it's fired, so even though it breaks, you get pottery pieces and they last forever. So you, whenever you're excavating, in any given day, one excavator will take a bucket you know, that full of pottery pieces that you'll find. Okay, so we're finding pottery all the time. And if you can learn to analyze the pottery, you can use that to help you date things, to help you see trade patterns, all kinds of stuff. So here we're looking at Iron Age cooking pots. Up on top is the classic cooking pot that was there for hundreds of years in this area. Now, um, an oven, an ancient oven goes like this. It kind of has an opening hole top. It's made out of clay and it goes like this with a pot belly and you put the fire in down here and then you have this opening like this at the top and you take the round bottom cooking pot and you put it in the top and that's how it gets hot, okay? Women for centuries have been cooking and burning their fingers because how do you cook up this, pick up this hot pot? Well, you got that little flange sticking out from the side, right? So you hook your fingers under it and you lift it up and you burn your fingers. They've been getting very frustrated for hundreds of years. <laughs> and finally, some woman, it had to be a woman who came up with this invention, said, wait a minute, what if we did a handle? And all the rest of the women in Israel look at each other and say, <laughs> after all these years, look at my fingers. We could have had handles. And as soon as somebody develops a handle, which, by the way, is right about the time of King David, somebody comes up with a handle, and the whole rest of the world says, of course, oh, for goodness sakes, and everybody makes handles after that. And once they make handles after that, now this flange isn't needed anymore, right? And so you see it start to disappear in the cross-section of the pot. So older cooking pots, pre-1000, they have flange. Post-1000, they have handle, and they have less flange. So this is Iron Age 1, this is Iron Age 2, this is Iron Age 3, basically. And so you know, if you find a pot with a cooking pot with a handle, you know it is at least after 1000. If you find a cooking pot without a handle and a flange, you know it's pre-1000. So just by that typology of the pot, you can tell what date the thing is. Is that right? Okay, much more to go on the typology thing, but let me, let me conclude by kind of the big picture, and that is, and this is important to me. When you study the Bible, you're not just studying a bunch of stories. This isn't, I, I had a nephew who once told me that he thought Jesus' stories were like Santa Claus stories. Well, we'll talk more about that later, but on a fundamental level, no. I study all kinds of ancient literature, ancient religious literature, ancient mythology, and all that sort of stuff. And for the most part, those stories take place in their own time and space. It doesn't have anything to do with the real world. This stuff you're reading, this is about the real world. This is the God of the universe engaging people in the quite literally dirty existence of their own lives among their broken cooking pots and falling down houses and siege warfare and broomsticks, God is at work. If God cares to be engaged in their world, despite all their shortcomings, despite all their dirt, then I think we can have some degree of confidence that he will be involved in ours as well. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time together. We thank you that you lower yourself to work among us in the dirt of our everyday lives. And therefore, we consecrate it to you. In Christ's name, amen. amen.